No, no. The angle of the camera. No, no. No, the only person you can see, unfortunately, is me. So <laughs> I've kind of, uh, yeah, I kind of set it up like that. Uh, so uh, Revelation. There's where we're at. Revelation chapter four. And um, tonight we're just going to do again one verse because there is quite a lot in these verses. <coughs> And we're on Revelation chapter 4 and verse 5, which I shall read out. Revelation 4 verse 5. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Uh, yeah, so quite brief there, but um, I thought it was worth just kind of re doing a bit of a recap. Um, so over the last couple of weeks, I've been averaging kind of a verse a week, haven't I, I think? Um, and I don't know if that helps people. It helps me, uh, but I think also a bit of a bit of a recap is useful, isn't it? Um, Hey, come in. Um, so, yes, we're on Revelation 4, verse, uh, verse 5. Um, if anyone wants to sit here, by the way, you're not, you won't be in the camera. Camera's focus. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, just to kind of recap of what we've done over the last few weeks, um, we did a door opening, door opening in heaven, that is to say, the, do you remember I said it was like the revealing of heaven, it's kind of just opening heaven up and showing it in this, this vision that John is seeing, uh, and as the, as the door, the sort of metaphorical door opened, God was at the centre. Remember, there's a throne, and on the throne was um, were, were was two precious stones, or at least a precious stone and a gem. Both were red in colour. And you remember I said that that possibly that the uh, red opaque stone represents the blood of Christ. The uh, red uh, ruby, the sardine stone, I think it was, um, uh, lit up with light. Rep might might represent uh, the fire of the Holy Spirit, and that that it was um, a picture of the Trinity. So again, this is all in symbolism, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's kind of these are theological um, statements being made in a kind of almost a poetic way uh, by using all these, these different symbols. Uh, so the door opens. Uh, first of all, we get God. He's enthroned. He's displaying uh, the attributes. Um, that make him God, and then around the throne, um, around the throne are the twenty-four elders, which again I said represent exceptional believers, uh, those that have won the crowns that Jesus talks about, because each of these these elders has a crown and has um, a robe representing um, a life of holiness. And so, so it's. I hope that kind of fits in with with your understanding of, or of what I've been teaching for the last few weeks. This is a glimpse into heaven. This is a glimpse into, um, if you like, uh, God's God's court. You know, uh, those who are closest uh, to the Lord, and um, and yes, those who have won these rewards through their good works. Uh, and yes, as I've said before, Jesus is very interested in good works, isn't he? Uh, uh, because when we did the seven churches, do you remember? Uh, every church, Jesus was saying, I know thy works. I know thy works. Mm -hmm. So people who say, oh, it's not all about works. You know, God understands. It's just about faith. They don't understand or they haven't read Revelation and, and other parts of the scriptures where, yes, our salvation is by grace through faith but it is not that faith that doesn't produce works that's not real faith 
faith must produce works. It must produce um, a life that has been changed by the Spirit of God. Um, th that's what James is, is, is saying, isn't he? He's inferring is that if your faith isn't producing good works, if you're not being transformed as a person, and remember, um, um, words words are works as well, uh, then then it's questionable whether you really have faith, uh, the, 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 the proper saving faith. Uh, so Jesus is very interested uh, in those works and, uh, uh, and emphasizes that. Uh, and now we're going to look a little bit further into this, uh, into this vision. If you've got hold of that, if you can kind of, as it were, picture it so far. Uh, so out of the throne... Um, proceed lightnings and thunderings and voices. So remember what I said um, over the last couple of weeks. If you're really kind of wanting to understand the scripture, this isn't foolproof, but it's helpful. Um, content, context, cross-reference. So what's in the content? Don't try and add something that that might that isn't there. Don't don't. Be guilty of what they call eisegesis or eisegesis, where you're kind of, you know, starting with your own ideas and then sort of saying, oh, well, you know, you're kind of putting it into the text. So it's content. Then it's context. What's the context around it? What are, what are the other things that are being said? And then it's cross-reference. And so when it comes to thunderings and lightnings, there's quite a lot of things we can cross-reference in the Bible. So let's do that. Uh, let's turn to Exodus 19. Exodus 19. And um, and verse 17. So this is where the Lord is going to come down to Mount Sinai and uh, speak to the people. And you just get the kind of... Uh, the kind of the the feeling of this. So in fact, let's start at um, verse sixteen. So Exodus nineteen sixteen, and it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount, and the voice of a trumpet exceeding loud. So it kind of reminds us, doesn't it, of Revelation one. Remember where, where John hears the voice mm. that's like a trumpet. It's loud, it's clear. Um, so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood. Can you imagine it? We're going to meet with God. <laughs> and it's like, ugh. Uh, it brought them out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke. In other words, it was, it was like, like a volcano. Because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mount quaked greatly. So like, like an earthquake. Girls, pay attention please. I think they just accidentally knocked the table. Yeah. Just the so, and the smoke of the furnace and the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered by answered him by a voice. So, it's thundering, it's lightning, the smoke on the mountain, and God is is speaking. And then, um, sort of skipping over to Exodus 20, verse 18. And this is after uh, God has, has um, delivered the what we call the Ten Commandments. Verse 18. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed... And stood afar off. And they said unto Moses. Speak thou with us. And we will hear. But let not God speak with us. Lest we die. So it's like. It's that scary. You know. It's like. Okay Moses. You tell us what God is saying. 
but please don't let him speak because it's just you know it, it you get a sense of awe you know an awe of God and a reverence for God but also a kind of fear as well you know there's all this kind of and, and often it's like that with thunder and lightning isn't it it can be amazing to watch and my dad used to love to watch storms he would kind of literally see so he would open his door and sit in the doorway with a cup of tea and watch while the storm was kind of going on uh, but also it's a little bit scary isn't it mm. you know because you see just that incredible power um, and and thunder and lightning are two things uh, that are associated with power and they're demonstrations that can be heard seen and felt as well can't they if the thunder's really loud you actually feel it in your body and i think this is you know important as well that there's these thunderings these lightnings that are coming from the throne of god they can be seen they can be heard and they can be felt and and the things of god are like that they can at times they can be seen and at times you can hear this you know because like uh, what, is it, what does it say, you know, he who has ears to hear, let him hear, you know. And so th this is the kind of, the idea of the presence of God is something that can be tangible. It can, it can affect um, our senses uh, and we come to this sense of awe and fear. Uh, and, and, and the Bible compares God to natural phenomena. And it does this in many places, particularly in the Psalms. So if you turn to Psalm 77. Psalm 77. And verse, uh, verse 18 says the voice of thy thunder was in the heaven the lightnings lightened the world the earth trembled and shook so the voice of thy thunder there's, now there's a connection between thunder lightnings and the voice of god um in fact uh in job 28 26 it says that he that is god made a decree for the rain and a way for the lightning of the thunder so it's like god is directing it god's actually directing the thunder and the lightning it's like as if it's his voice it's his comment if you like that he's he's making and it reminded me when i was kind of looking into that and, and read this in Job. it reminded me you might remember this uh, will um Actually, maybe you'd be a bit young now I think about it. But um, years ago, in the 80s, um, the Church of England installed uh, a new bishop, the Bishop of Durham. And uh, there was a lot of controversy over it because this particular bishop didn't believe in the virgin birth, didn't believe in the resurrection, mm -hmm. and made it clear that um, other people didn't have to believe in that either uh, if they became Christians. And, um, and what happened was that uh, three days after his consecration at, uh, at York Minster, the cathedral was struck by lightning and it resulted in a disastrous fire. Um, and there were a lot of people, uh, including certain clergymen, who were saying, this is God's comment on what has happened, mm. you know. And who knows, maybe it was, I have no idea. But, uh, uh, yeah, God sometimes speaks as it were through the thunder through the lightning through these natural um natural phenomena and these natural f phenomena kind of are a reflection of of his power you know mm -hmm. if it, when you see how powerful lightning is and and thunder and how awe-inspiring it is to think that well if that's how powerful they are what is the one like who has created those things more powerful more awe-inspiring um, now there are voices plural from the throne um, does that mean you know who is speaking then um, 
Well, I think it just could simply be a way of describing what it's like if God speaks. So in Daniel 10 verse 6, it says the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. So like lots and lots of people all speaking at once. You know, like, like that kind of, like a crowd roaring, I suppose, is, is the picture. Um, uh, and again, uh, Ezekiel 43, 2 says, And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east, and his voice was like a noise of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. Um, again, Psalm 29, 3, the voice of the Lord is upon the waters, the God of glory thunders. Uh, so it's like, yeah, it could just be, you know, we have all these different images. Uh, it's like a multitude. It's like many waters. It's roaring. It's like thunder. In other words, when God speaks, it's loud. It's overwhelming, you know, in one sense. It's kind of, it makes you a little bit afraid, you know. And I think that's part of, uh, how should we say it, part of the attributes of God that has been lost in certain Christian traditions. It's like the approachability of God, the gentleness of God has been emphasised, but it's been overemphasised so that, you know, you're losing that kind of element of, well, yeah, but God is like powerful. God is the judge. God is the king, you know. Um, so, so it's that kind of, what would you call it, um, monarchical kind of, you know, that sort of, like, like you know, when the when it's the Queen's Day, oh, let's 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 bring it up today. When it's the Queen's Jubilee, you know, uh, lots of people love the Queen and think she does a great job and think she's a wonderful uh, person and they admire her and so on. But also, there's a kind of a, a slight distance, there's a respect, isn't there? You, you know, you wouldn't just go up to the Queen and go. Hi Liz, you know, and, and it's sort of like, well hopefully it, it's like that distance that, that, you know, God is close to us, yeah, he's like a father, but also we need to remember who he is, you know, um, so, so um, yeah, so we have that in, in, in Exodus 20, uh, as I just said, that the people say, you know, let not God speak with us lest we die. So that is the reality of God's power um, uh, and a knowledge of this, a knowledge of who he is um, and the power that he has stops us from becoming sort of blasé about God. You know, um, uh, I've heard Christians say, well, oh, I shout at God. You know, and it's like you lost your mind, you know. Um, they have a lot to learn, you know, they're, they're not demonstrating what the Bible calls the fear of God. Not a cringing kind of fear, God's going to punish me, you know, but a kind of awe and a respect uh, for who he is and for the, for the power uh, that he has. And, and it's amazing, isn't it, that that God who is like that, who thunders, has condescended to come and to dwell with us in the person of Jesus Christ and is truly so loving, so patient, mm. uh, so father-like with us. Um, and that's just a measure of the love of God, isn't it? So it's mm. these things are sometimes, as they would say, held in tension, you know, that, that God is this awesome, overwhelming, powerful king, but he's also like a gentle father who loves us uh, and who's leading us and who's in, who cares about, is interested in us, you know, um, and, and wants us to cast our cares upon him. Um, so the second part of the verse, uh, just um, finishing off really, second part of the verse says, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Uh, and this takes us right back really to the opening of Revelation, Revelation chapter 1. Um, and, uh, and verse 4, the sort of the, the, the latter part of verse 4, where it says, um, where it says, uh, peace from him which is and which was and which is to come 
Okay, so this is Jesus, right? He, he is, he was, and he is to come. He will return. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. So again, we've got this, this seven spirits. And if you remember at the time, I said here seven is a, is a, a symbolic number. Seven represents the number of spiritual perfection. So it's the seven spirits, or rather the sevenfold spirit of God, the perfect spirit of God. That's what seven means. It's, it's the perfect number. So this is the perfect spirit of God. And this idea of seven, um, what was the word it used? Uh, seven lamps of fire is a picture of the menorah, the candlestick that you mm -hmm. see on in Jewish uh, synagogues, we've seen, you know, so you you have like seven branches coming out from the candle, um, but it's all one. It's actually all. In fact, in the instructions in the tabernacle where they make the menorah, uh, it says to make it out of one piece of gold. So it's all. It's not like you know, atta bits attached. It's all one. It's literally made hammered out of one piece of gold, uh, and this is a picture of the Holy Spirit. Um, so he he is the sevenfold spirit of God, yet he's one spirit, um, and uh, and here if we look at, back at Revelation uh, one and verse ten, um, it says, "I was in the spirit." This is John, of course, on the Lord's day, and he heard behind and heard behind me. A great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. <coughs> and what thou seest, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. This is Jesus speaking to him. Uh, and then we come down to verse 12. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And behold, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks one like unto the son of man so comparing that with um and sort of finishing off narrowly comparing that to verse four uh and this last part of verse four uh from the seven spirit spirits which are before his throne uh, so again it's almost um a replica of what we just read tonight in verse five isn't it there are these uh, sorry uh, of, of chapter four so there is this throne and there are the seven spirits before the throne. So it's like a little glimpse of heaven, uh, but with one difference. So in Revelation 4, who's on the throne? God, right? In Revelation 1, who's on the throne? Who's speaking? It's Jesus. So it's just another one of those kind of brilliant bits where... The, where Jesus is showing and claiming his his deity, you know, uh, revealing that he is God, and 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 that's so. If we put these two together and we picture that as a kind of the vision that we've seen, the door opens. There's God on the throne. There's the twenty four elders around him, and there now is the uh, uh, the seven spirits or the this kind of a picture as a candlestick, if you will. Uh, flaming uh, uh, branches of the candlestick. It's like, yeah, this is representing a God uh, in his trinity, the triunity of God and Christ himself being shown to be, uh, without doubt, uh, God.